in our third section of the technical animation segment, we will be going over replacing the initial block out animation clip we had from our animator with almost like the final version that will be used for the whole sequence that will actually be rendering out as well. So we see what we see on the screen is the whole the setup. Uh, this side here is very much the same as we just had uh, seen in section two with the secondary motion setup. Uh, we have three more three new nodes, which I'll explain in just a second. And then on this side, we have the animation. Now it's a bit more nodes than you would expect from um, just bringing in like, one single clip. But the reason we have so many is because we've decided to go for a static uh, animation, so just in place, because that's how we wanted to render it. However, as I was working with this stuff, especially with the ragdoll setup, I noticed that if we can get the true space movement of our elephant, so we see here, this is like the animation our animator gave, uh, gave us, which is in place, and then the blockout itself had this spatial movement. Ragdoll works quite nicely. Um, if the skeleton also moves through space, especially for what we wanted to achieve with this scene, which is a bit of a, like a trip type of motion. We'll show that in a later section. So since we had this in the blockout to begin with, and it seems to work uh, to produce better results with our trip ragdoll setup, I've decided to use this uh, motion, or this forward motion, and apply it onto the, the final clip, so to speak. So this setup here is a it's fairly simple where we're just computing a motion clip for our from our blockout animation here to so the whole the whole segment here the whole clip we're extracting locomotion of this clip onto a locomotion joint so very similar to what we'd be doing with an extract locomotion sop then we're cycling the motion just to get a bit longer um, locomotion uh, trail here because our new animation is longer than our blockout so we want to just have multiple frames here and then we can extract only this uh, trail of a uh, locomotion joint using basically the frame. So we output just that, and we don't care about the other the other section. And then on this other end, same idea. We're just computing a motion clip. We see that animation is in place here, extracting the locomotion just as before, just to create this joint. Basically, nothing else because there's not much locomotion to go on here. And then we're motion clip updating our locomotion joint from the the block out that we just cycled onto our new one. We can apply this locomotion then to the um, primitives. So we see here output primitive transform and we don't actually need a locomotion joint anymore. Set a clip info just for easy to reference in the secondary motion sops that we set up in the previous section. And then we can motion clip evaluate and we just got ourselves a nice animation that moves forward in space. And it still matches our uh, actual translation very well because it was built by the same person and the quadruped motion stayed very much similar or even the same to the blockout. So a very nice little and simple trick to use here just to get this forward motion. We are going to extract the locomotion again at the end, but after the ragdoll. So we get that nice like velocity uh, as the elephant moves through space. So this is the setup of the animation here. And then this is the block out, the old one, just to, to show um, how easy it is to basically just swap between them. So now if we have a look at the result with our newest animation, we are getting very similar effects to the ears, right? Trunk, tail. So everything behaves as we would expect, as we just configured it, except now it's running on a different, different stream. If we switch back to our original block out, we see we're getting exactly the same. Um, results that we configured. So that's definitely the beauty of procedural setups where we're, then that's why you know, we, we can afford to set all these things up ahead of time before we have the actual final motion because then we can very easily swap them um, into the system and the system will just handle it uh, as we would expect. Now the new nodes that we added here are specific to the get up motion that we didn't have in the block out. So that's why they we added this uh, and they're not in the initial one. So we see here when our elephant gets up that we are getting some, um, definitely some more drastic movement, especially, you know, in the head and the pelvis a bit as well. So at the top, we have two configure joints for the ears and for the tail. And 
the purpose of these ones is to limit how much our ears and tail can rotate. So to illustrate this better, I will come here to the getup. So notice how we also get these protrusions with the tail in the leg here. This is something that I'll be fixing at the very end, just using a rig pose, because it's a very simple fix and we don't have to mess with any parameters because we're happy with overall motion. But if I disable this limit and let it propagate through, then we see that we're getting almost like um, on the get up, like completely going inwards type of motion because that's how the pelvis rotates. So this is a bit too much um, and it's a bit definitely a bit trickier and to, to fix properly because we're kind of disrupting the, the swing here as we're going forward. So adding this limit here gives us that, that bit of an edge um, when it comes to fixing the, this problem towards the end because we're getting this swing kept like we're getting it um, swinging properly and even though we're still having a protrusion it's going to be easier to just offset it slightly away from uh, our legs and then for the ears if we disable this it's also mainly used for the get up so if we look at our ear setup here um, we're not using the configuration attribute we are using it on the mid now um, and the reason is because Again, if we play this, so we're still having working it just as, as we say wrap so nicely. So no, no, no changes needed there. But on the get up, we see we're getting these artifacts here because the motion of the head is so much more drastic than what we had in the blockout. The effect that gets applied here is much stronger. So we don't really want to be modifying our parameters since we're quite happy with them and they work very well for the actual walks so both the quadruped and the biped walk make it make the ears behave as we want them to the only real problem we're having is with the get up so we can either modify this by hand with a rig pose or something similar as we will with the tail at the end or we can create this limit here which will limit how far the ears can actually go and this will allow us to basically get rid of that artifact almost entirely in the get up and have everything else behave the same way because we're just limiting we're creating a threshold where we're limiting the years and we're not really going over or under that threshold except in that get up so this works very well for for this particular scene so we might as well just do it here and then don't have to worry about adding any corrections by by hand and the last addition that we we've, uh, we've made is this secondary motion tail up so one thing was the tail didn't behave as well on the biped walk that it did on the quadruped walk. It was a bit too accentuated on the, the biped walk. So in order to, to fix that, um, I decided to just branch them into two separate nodes. It's probably the easiest way to do it. You can also, you know, split off the stream. So basically add this on this on the right here from here and then do like a blend, like a skeleton blend or something similar to blend between them on a particular frame via keyframe. But I chose to just have a separate node downstream and use blending that's available on the node to basically say our original motion, I want to play all the way to frame 60. So we are getting to frame 60, what we configured in the previous section, exactly the same wiggle. And then on frame 60, we're starting to blend out of this one all the way to 65. So if we just have a look at this one and we set it to modify to in place, we see at frame 60, we're blending out and then we're going back to static. And then on the, the tail up, we're doing the same here, except we're starting the blend at frame 65. So as we finish the first blend of the quadruped walk, we're then blending into the biped walk. And this allows us to basically have different parameters affecting the same amount of joints. But um we determine the timeline section when this actually takes place and we see the effect on the biped walk it's much more uh, dulled down because yeah we don't want it the the tail to be swinging too crazily especially since the pelvis here is rotated a bit a bit uh, in an unnatural pose to say the least so this works for our scene uh, very well and these the rest of the nodes uh, stay the same so really the only additions we had to make here 
were related to this addition of this, like basically from quadruped to biped walk and the biped walk itself, because that wasn't accounted to in the, the blockout. Once we get this in, and we know for sure that this clip is going to be our final animation, potential some tweaks here and there, but the overall like motion will stay the same. We can fill these holes in the secondary motion setup here, make sure they work as intended, make sure we're happy with how the result looks, and then proceed to integrating uh, this new motion into the ragdoll tool, uh, adding that extra layer of uh, ragdoll setup with the tripping motion and all that stuff. And once that's also taken care of, we can then merge them together and proceed to the final result.